Hey everyone, for this session, we're going to be looking at cosmic distance and cosmic time. So finally getting into some actual astronomy rather than just talking about the general properties of the course and stuff on the scientific method. So we're going to start by considering the sizes of objects. So let's look at some of the planets in our solar system. So Earth is the biggest terrestrial, which is a kind of rock metal planet. So we've got the Earth, Venus, Mars, Mercury. Again, Earth is a little bit larger, just a bit larger than Venus, um, but they're all pretty similar sizes. But when we compare the Earth and the terrestrial planets to the Jovian planets, they're really dwarf. This is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. And when we look at the sun compared to everything else in the solar system, the sun actually makes up 99.8% of all of the mass in the solar system. So when you talk about our solar system, you can really think of it as the sun plus a tiny little bit of debris. Um, you know, I kind of like the one little piece of debris that we're on, but again, on this scale, Earth is just absolutely minuscule here. Um, so let's actually talk about some just definitions of objects and how some of these objects relate to each other, like the differences between moons, planets, stars, galaxies, etc. So when we talk about moons, moons will orbit planets, so moons orbit planets. Uh, planets will orbit their star. So I'm trying to give like a, a nested hierarchy of how these things kind of increase in size, generally speaking. So moons orbit around planets. So our moon is orbiting around the Earth. The Earth is orbiting around stars, or sun. Uh, there are also rogue planets that are just kind of out there creating through space, but we're just going to look at the general parts of that. So the planets plus their host star, planets plus host star, uh, that's a solar system. So when we talk about our solar system, we're talking about the sun plus Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, like all the planets, plus all their moons are kind of all orbiting around the sun, plus asteroids, comets, that whole thing is the solar system. And just to be, just to uh, kind of point this out, there are many solar systems that can have two or even three, that's usually around the max that it gets to, can have uh, two or three stars as well. So it's not always just one star per solar system, but just a couple usually. Now we can have star clusters. Or uh, let me let me keep it in this form. So lots of stars. And form star clusters. So this is where we've got sometimes thousands or in some cases, even millions of individual stars all kind of orbiting around each other in these complicated ways. So we can have star clusters and um, galaxies are made of many, many of these star clusters. So uh, there are many billions stars in a galaxy, as well as things like clouds of gas and dust that are actually used to make stars. We'll talk about those later on. Um, but this is hopefully a kind of a nested hierarchy of different kinds of objects and how they relate to each other. So moons orbit around planets, planets orbit around stars, the planet and the, the planets and all of their host stars make up a solar system. Lots of stars can form star clusters. Many billions of stars form galaxies. And we'll talk about even larger structures in just a little bit. So again, when we look at our solar system, it's mostly just the sun plus a little bit of debris. But our sun isn't even considered to be a very large star. Um, 
when we compare it to stars like Sirius, Pollux, and Arcturus, our sun is pretty small. Jupiter is just one little pixel on the corner of this image. Zooming out even more, well, there's other stars that are called supergiant stars getting into these things that if the star Betelgeuse was inside of our solar system, it would envelop everything, I think, up to and a little bit past the orbit of, of Jupiter almost. Forget if it's Jupiter, if it's in Jupiter or not. But again, these are just absolutely enormous, even compared to our sun. So there are some very, very large stars up there. And again, our galaxy is way, way larger than that because there are many billions of stars in individual galaxies as well. Okay, so let's go back to kind of the Earth and switch to distances from the Earth. So I made this slide of the Earth and the Moon, and they're on the same scale, and the distance between them is the same scale as well. So this part is to scale. Uh, pause the video and think of where do you think you'd find the International Space Station and where do you think you'd find the Hubble telescope on this image? So try to identify where do you think the International Space Station is where humans have resided, I think, continuously since 2001. Um, and where's the Hubble telescope? So for the Earth and the Moon, the distance between them is uh, just under 400,000 kilometers away. The International Space Station is only about 250 miles above the Earth. So if you have a kind of standard globe, the International Space Station is just a tiny, tiny bit above that kind of orbiting around the Earth. And the same kind of thing for the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble Space Telescope is only about 350 miles uh, above the Earth. Now I should point out, that the James Webb Space Telescope, the successor to Hubble that you may have heard of over the last couple months, uh, that one is quite a bit further away. If I remember correctly, it's about 2 million kilometers away from the Earth, so it's out past the moon. But one of the things that I want to emphasize, especially with this Hubble Space Telescope, is that when we have telescopes in space, we don't put telescopes into space so that they are appreciably closer to other stars or other objects out in space. We do it so they're outside of the Earth's atmosphere. So the effect that the atmosphere has on light coming in, telescopes in space don't have to deal with that. So we can get better images from outside of Earth's atmosphere. Um, but we'll talk about those aspects of telescopes a little bit later. For distances in the solar system, let's say that the sun was the size of a basketball. So we're scaling everything down. So our sun, which we said was the majority of the mass of the solar system, was about the size of a basketball. Okay. In that scale, the Earth would be about 30 yards away. So kind of across the width of a you know medium-sized building. And the Earth would only be kind of a small object like that compared to our basketball sun. And Mercury and Venus are a little bit closer to the sun than the Earth is. Mars is a little bit further away from the sun than the Earth is. But all of these inner terrestrial planets are fairly close to the sun, especially when you compare them to the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Um, on the same scale with the sun being the size of a basketball, uh, and Earth being about 20, or sorry, about 30 yards away, Neptune would be a little bit shy of a mile away. So our the bulk of our solar system would be about a one mile radius on this particular scale. Okay. So that's kind of the size of the solar system. Again, these inner planets are all pretty close to each other, all pretty close to the sun. And the Earth no matter where it's at in its orbit, it's always closer to the sun than it is to Jupiter. Again, the outer planets are a lot more spread out um, than the inner planets are. Now, let's say we want to go to the next nearest star and think about this model solar system that we have. The sun is the size of a basketball. The earth is about 30 yards away. The rest of the solar system's all within around a mile, except 
some of the very, very outer parts of the solar system. Then where would the next nearest star to the sun be located? You know, let's say we're in Ohio, but let's say, um, I'll use my home campus. Let's say we're in Chillicothe, Ohio. Where do you think the next nearest star would be? Well, the next nearest star would actually be in uh, Eastern Europe. So when we're talking about distances inside the solar system compared to distances to other solar systems, it is a massive jump in distance. And one result of that is, think about how often would you expect stars from different solar systems to actually run into each other? If one star is the size of a basketball and located at some location, some location in the US, and let's say we even compressed the distances between different stars. Let's say there was another basketball, another person holding a basketball at some other location in the US, and they were just kind of walking around. What do you think the odds are that they would ever run into each other? Probably pretty low. There is so much space between stars that stars from different solar systems very, very rarely run into each other. Um, as the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the Douglas Adams book mentions, space is big, really big. You simply cannot imagine how vastly mind-bogglingly big it is and, and so on. So again, going from distances in our solar system to even the next nearest star is a huge leap in distance. These are some of the stars that are within about 10 light years of our sun. And in order to understand these kind of different scales, we need some new types of quantities. When we're talking about distances inside of our own solar system, we're gonna call these smallish distances, even though they are ridiculously large distances. We have what's called an astronomical unit, one AU. So this astronomical unit is defined as the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So average distance between Earth and Sun. And this is approximately um, the exact, the more specific number is 1.49 times 10 to the 11 meters. I'm gonna write this as around 150 million kilometers. In miles, I think it's something like 93 million, if I'm remembering the, the units in miles. Um, so around 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers. Okay? So that's inside of the solar system. We generally measure things in a year. For larger distances to things outside of the solar system, we generally talk about things in terms of light years. So one light year, It's the distance, a beam of light would travel in one year. So a light year is a unit of distance. And light is the fastest thing that we know of. As far as we know, it's the fastest thing that can move through space. And if you do the calculation for the speed of light times the speed of light is 300 million meters per second, and one year is about 31 and a half million seconds. You do that, you get about 9.4 trillion kilometers. This is about 9.4 trillion kilometers. So again, the jump from measuring things in astronomical units to measuring things in light years, there's a little bit more than 60,000 astron astronomical units that make up one light year. So again, it's a huge jump in distance. So when we look at our Milky Way galaxy, um, again, earlier on, we talked about the some stars within about 10 light years of our sun. The closest star is uh, Proxima Centauri. It's about 4.2 light years distance from us. When we look at the Milky Way galaxy as a whole, the Milky Way galaxy 
it's approximately 100,000 light years across. So if I fired a beam of light from one end of the Milky Way galaxy, it would take 100,000 years for it to cross all the way across the length of the galaxy, even though it's the fastest thing in our universe. Our solar system is about two thirds of the way out in one of these uh, spiral arms. And basically all of the stars that you can see at night without the use of a telescope are within about 2000 light years of earth. So even though you look at the night sky and you see this, you know, massive expanse of stars, like just huge numbers of stars, that is just a little area around our own galaxy. And there are somewhere between 100 and 200 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. The definition of that number depends on exactly what kinds of stars you're including. There's certain classes of stars where it's unclear whether we should call them stars or something else. But again, something measured in the hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. So again, there's many billions of stars in a galaxy. If you've ever had the chance to go to a, uh, say, camping or something in a very remote area without uh, light pollution, with very low cloud cover, you may have been able to see the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. But even looking in that disk of the Milky Way galaxy, you're only seeing things relatively close to us in our own Milky Way galaxy. Again, space is really big. Our Milky Way galaxy is a part of a local group of galaxies. Um, so there's some galaxies, uh, some smaller galaxies that orbit around the Milky Way galaxy. This is, covers a distance of about 2 million light years. And then if you zoom out even more, there's our local group of galaxies that includes things like the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, this covers a distance across of about 11 million light years. Yes. So we can add to this list of, ob of objects um, that galaxies, maybe I'll give myself a little bit more space down here, galaxies form groups, clusters, and superclusters of galaxies. So in the same kind of way that you'll get star clusters where lots of stars are kind of orbiting around each other and interacting gravitationally, in a similar way, but on a much, much larger scale, you'll have these galaxies that are orbiting around each other um, and kind of grouped together in these sorts of ways. Zooming out even more, we've got things like the Whirlpool Galaxy. This is about 37 million light years away. Uh, the Virgo Galaxy Cluster, uh, the center of which is around 50 million light years away. In fact, we are just on the very kind of outer edge of the Virgo supercluster. Um, again, these groups and clusters are um, sets of galaxies that are kind of gravitationally orbiting around each other in complicated ways, varying from dozens of galaxies to hundreds of galaxies, and even getting to superclusters that can contain many thousands of individual galaxies. So we get certain regions where we have these superclusters where we get uh, groups of galaxies kind of bound together and these other regions called voids where there are very few, if any, galaxies. So we get these superclusters and voids uh, throughout our observable universe. This is an image of the Hubble deep field of galaxies. I should get the new one, uh, the new deep field image that was taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, but this one's still interesting for historical reasons. The size of this image is like if you looked at, you know, uh, uh, the end of your fingernail held at arm's length. If you looked at the end of your fingernail held at arm's length, the size of that on the sky is larger than the region of the sky that this deep field is looking at. And every little point of light that you see on here is not a star, it's its own individual galaxy. So there are tens of thousands of galaxies in this one tiny little area of the sky um, 
And these galaxies are somewhere between 2.5 to 10.5 billion light years away from us. Again, there was a new one taken with the James Webb Space Telescope, and I should update this to show some of those new images. This is a map of the local universe around us, some of the areas where there are more clusters of galaxies, some regions where there are not nearly as many galaxies. Again, we get these um, local, our, our local supercluster. We get these uh, areas where there are voids, where there are very few galaxies. So when we look at the distribution of galaxies across the sky, we see on a certain scale that they're kind of clumped together in certain areas and not very many galaxies in other areas. Let me reset my video for this. Go. I recommend this video, this uh, Cosmic Voyage video. I'll put a link to this on Blackboard so you can catch it. Um, it's a video that has that simulates a continual zoom out, starting with, uh, I think, a location in Italy, just continually zooming out and you see just how large everything is. I highly recommend a quick watch of that. So let's do a, a quick question based on this. Uh, let's consider these objects, the moon, the Whirlpool Galaxy, uh, this deep field image of galaxies, the Hubble Telescope, the Pleiades Star Cluster, Saturn, and the Sun. And let's try to arrange these in order of actual size. So pause the video here and see if you can arrange these in order from, let's say, smallest to largest. Okay, so hopefully you've paused the video and, and had a try at this yourself. So let's kind of go through some of these. So the smallest object on here is probably going to be the one that people built, the Hubble Space Telescope. It's about the size of a city bus. Um, on our hierarchy of objects and their sizes, we know that moons orbit planets. So most moons are smaller than most planets. So our moon is the next smallest object on this list. Uh, the planets are generally going to be larger than moons, but smaller than individual stars. So Saturn would be the next largest on this list. And then we've got our sun. Again, our sun is the majority of the mass in our solar system. We have this star cluster, the Pleiades star cluster of, again, there are hundreds of indiv individual stars. There's a lot that are especially bright since it's um, for reasons that we'll talk about in a little bit. And then galaxies contain billions of individual stars. So uh, we've got the galaxy and then we've got this cluster of galaxies in that deep field image. So hopefully yours were close. And again, if whenever you have questions about any of this, feel free to post it as a discussion question, come to office hours, ask about those um, and find that help. Uh, let's try this one instead. So now we're gonna look at how far away from the earth are each of these objects. So we're gonna have the same set of objects, the moon, whirlpool galaxy, deep field galaxies, Hubble telescope, Pleiades, uh, Saturn and the sun. And we're going to rank these from closest to the earth to furthest away. So again, pause the video and have a try at that. Okay, so let's say we've got the Earth. Um, we said that the Hubble telescope, even though it looks at very distant objects, it's only a little bit away from the Earth. So the Hubble telescope would be the next nearest. After that, we've got our moon. So the moon, our moon orbits the Earth. The next one, this might've gotten some people, the next one would be the sun. Since the Earth is one of these um, one of the planets that's in the inner solar system, what we call the inner solar system, those terrestrial planets are all pretty close together compared to the outer planets that get much, much more spaced out. So we've got the sun, then we've got Saturn. After that, we've got the Pleiades star cluster. That star cluster you can see with your own eyes. If you can see that with your own eyes, it's still inside of the Milky Way galaxy. And then we've got the uh, Whirlpool Galaxy. Again, we can see it in a lot of detail, so it's probably a little bit closer to us than some of the other galaxies. This deep field of galaxies is much, much further away. Okay, let's switch from, actually, let's do this one first. Uh, let's try to identify what our cosmic address is. Once you have Ohio, USA, 
how would you arrange the following six items so that they're in the correct cosmic order going to larger and larger scales? Like you'd have, you know, your house number, the street where there's a lot of houses, the town where there's a lot of streets, the state where there's a lot of towns to, to USA. How would you arrange these in correct cosmic order? Pause the video and have a look at Okay, so for this ranking, um, after Ohio, USA, what's the next kind of small scale thing that we would have? Well, it would be the Earth. The US is a country in the Earth, on the Earth, I guess. Well, then we've got our solar system. So the Earth is in the solar system. Our solar system is a part of the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is part of our own little local group of galaxies. I should have specified that this is the local group of galaxies, the local supercluster of galaxies. It would be the local group of galaxies, the local, local supercluster, and then the universe. So this would be the ranking of how these six items would be arranged to make your cosmic address. And I guess it would be good to kind of finish up this. So we said galaxies form groups, clusters, and superclusters of galaxies. The um, all of the galaxies we can see, all galaxy clusters we can see, make up what's called the observable universe. Make up the observable universe. So again, kind of doing this zoom in, and I do still recommend that Cosmic Voyage video because it has kind of an animation going through these transitions. We've got the Earth is in the solar system. The solar system is in our Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is part of this local group of galaxies. Our local group is part of this local supercluster of galaxies. And that's just one supercluster in many, many superclusters that make up the observable universe. And there could be even more universe beyond that at that point, we just don't know. Uh, we don't have data to work from for extending that. Let's try another version. Um, we're going to look at how old each of these objects are. And this one's going to be a little bit unfair. Um, let's try to rank these in order of their age from youngest to oldest. And please note when you're trying this for yourself that there can be some ties if we have some that our, our ties are, are, that's allowed in this. So pause this, give it a try, see if you can identify that if some are probably gonna be around the same age or not, and then try to uh, rank these. So give a minute for that. Okay, so going from youngest to oldest, youngest, again, probably the one that people made, uh, we need to update these slides a little bit. Um, it's around 30 years old at this point. Uh, the next youngest is probably going to surprise people. It's this Pallades star cluster. Again, this one was probably unfair to ask at this point in the course. Later on in the course, we're going to talk about star life cycles, and we're going to see how these very, very bright blue energetic stars actually have a very short lifespan, at least compared to other stars like our own sun. Um, this Pleiades star cluster is estimated to only be around 100 million years old. So, you know, in the time of the dinosaurs, at least the Jurassic uh, and, and Triassic times of the dinosaurs, these stars wouldn't have been in their sky. They would not have formed yet. Most of our solar system formed at pretty much the same time. So our sun, the moon, Saturn, we can say those are all pretty much the same age at around four and a half billion years old. And the oldest ones, these galaxies, evidence is suggesting that most of these galaxies did most of their formation around 12 billion years ago. Again, later on in the course, we're going to go into much more detail on how do we measure these kinds of cosmic time? How do we develop models, scientific models to describe some of these different kinds of cosmic time? 
Uh, how do we describe some of these distances and size scales? We're going to be going into a lot more detail on that later on in the course. This is just kind of a survey so far. Now, we were talking a little bit about light and the speed of light uh, traveling at this kind of fastest speed in the universe, this 300 million meters per second. As far as we know, it's the fastest thing that is possible in the universe, the fastest thing that can move through space in the universe. But that's still a finite speed. It still takes a certain amount of time for light to travel, which means that if there's an object that's far away and it's emitting some light or reflecting some light or, or we're getting some light from that object, it takes a certain amount of time for that light to reach our eye. In fact, if you have just an ordinary ruler, like a one foot ruler around that long, that is about one billionth of a second for light. It takes light one billionth of a second to cross that ruler. So if you're looking at something that is one foot away, you're looking at that object, the light that was given off that by that object one billionth of a second ago. The further away the object is, the more of those rulers that object is away, the longer ago that light was emitted. So when we are looking at distant objects, we are literally looking at those objects as they were further and further back in the past. So for example, the moon, uh, the moon is about 1.3 light seconds away from us. When we look at the moon, we are seeing it as it was about 1.3 seconds ago. Uh, the sun is around eight and a half minutes um, for light to get from the sun to us. So if the sun exploded right now, we would be blissfully unaware of it for eight and a half minutes and then have a very, very bad day. Um, but again, the further away you get, the further back in time you are looking. So the star Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, is about eight when you're looking at it, you're seeing it as it was about eight years ago. The Andromeda galaxy, you're seeing it as it was about 2.5 million years ago. If it's about 2.5 million light years away from us, you are seeing it as it was in the past. So when we develop more and more powerful telescopes that are able to see things that are further and further away, the further away we look, we are literally looking further and further back in time. So when we look at very distant galaxies that are a few billion years away, we are actually seeing them as they were when they were very young, when they were early in their formation. We can see some images of galaxies that are very, very redshifted. We'll talk about redshift a lot later on in the course, um, but we are seeing some of these galaxies as they were only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, after the you know beginning of our area of the universe in, in their very earliest stages of formation. The James Webb Space Telescope is specifically designed in part to be able to see this very, very redshifted light. And we'll, again, we'll talk about what redshift means later on in the course. Um, but this new telescope is specifically designed to be able to see galaxies in their early, early formation because it's looking at the galaxies that are so, so far away that we're seeing them very, very far into the past. Now, there's an interesting additional consequence of this, that the universe, our local presentation of space-time, uh, has a finite age. Um, again, we're going to be talking about the Big Bang Theory a lot more later on in the course and the evidence for it and more of the details. Um, but if the universe has a finite age, then that means there's a maximum distance that light can travel in that time. So the universe is around 13.8 billion years old. So that means if something's too far away, if there was a light source that was you know, too far away, there may not have been enough time in the universe, in the entire lifetime of the universe, for that light to make it to us. So we simply, there can be objects that are so far away that we simply can't detect them. Everything that, everything that we can see where light has had enough time to actually reach us, uh, we call that the observable universe. Now, 
in kind of playing around with cosmic time, there's it's really hard to visualize time. So there's a couple of tools that we often use to try to get a little bit better way of visualizing it. So one way of visualizing the history of the universe is by scaling it down into a single Earth year, saying that on January 1st, that's when the Big Bang occurred. That's when um, the universe expanded from a very small size, rapidly expanded, and, and kind of started what we see as our uh, observable universe. So if that happened on January 1st, and then at the end of this, at midnight on December 31st, that is the current moment. That is now. So on this cosmic calendar, January 1st is the Big Bang. And then by around the first or second week of February, that's when most galaxies are starting to form. And then there seems to be this long period where not much seems to be happening. There actually is some really important stuff happening in here, but we'll get to that in a minute. By September 3rd, that's when our solar system is starting to form. That's when our sun, the planets, and the Earth um, start to form around September 3rd. And then relatively quickly after that, by September 22nd, that's when early life, we start getting the first signs of early life. Like just barely after the crust of the Earth has solidified and stopped being molten, um, in a surprisingly short amount of time, we start seeing some evidence for life. At this point, it would be just single-celled microbial life, nothing multicellular. So we go through this long period. Eventually, we start getting multicellular stuff. And eventually, we get what's called the Cambrian explosion on December 16th. This is when uh, multicellular life forms, um, you know, larger life forms with more complex body plans start showing up more and more rapidly. Then we get around uh, December 29th is when the dinosaurs start showing up on Earth. And December 30th is the extinction of the dinosaurs. So on this cosmic timeline, the dinosaurs get about four days, four or five days uh, in this model. But where do humans show up? Well, for humans, we got to go to December 31st. This is right near the end of the cosmic calendar. Uh, early hominids would probably have shown up on the scene around 9 p.m. on the evening of December 31st. So this is kind of our, uh, our separation between what eventually became humans and what eventually developed into the other great apes. Uh, that would have been around 9 p.m. Around 11.58 p.m., that's when what you would call modern humans start showing up on the scene. Uh, 25 seconds till midnight, agriculture arises. 11 seconds to midnight, that's when the pyramids are built. One second ago, uh, Kepler and Galileo show that the Earth orbits the sun. And now we get the current moment in cosmic time. So just kind of think about how dinosaurs got four or five days on the cosmic calendar. And so far, modern humans have about two minutes on that cosmic calendar. Kind of kind of takes a hit to the ego a little bit. Um, but let's kind of list this in a, in a different way. And, and again, there are a whole bunch of dates in there. I don't expect you to memorize all of them. Let me just mention two dates that I do want you to remember. Uh, the age of the universe, our current best estimate is right around 13.8 billion years. How do we know this? Well, we're gonna go into more detail in this later on in the course, but this is largely determined by cosmology, by looking at the galaxies, the distant galaxies that we see that are moving away from us and the rate that they're moving away from us. If we know how far away those galaxies are and how fast they're moving away from us, we can kind of run that clock backwards and figure out, well, how long ago was it that all of the universe was compressed into this really little point? We can also look at the properties of what's called the cosmic microwave background. This is literally the afterglow of the Big Bang. When the Big Bang happened, it was an incredibly energetic event. And there's a lot of radiation from that event that is still moving through the universe today. And we can look at its properties and use that to kind of hone in on this, again, around 13.8 billion years. 
How old is the Earth? Around four and a half billion years old. How do we know this? Well, most of this is from something called radiometric dating. Basically, there are different types of radioactive elements that decay, will change from one element and decay into a, another element over a set time period. So if we know what that rate is, that rate of decay is, and we look at certain elements, certain crystals in meteorites, in very old rock samples on the Earth and in lunar samples, things like that, we can identify, well, how much of the original decay element is still there and how much of the decay products have been produced. This is again an oversimplification, but it just kind of gives you the general idea of how we use this radiometric dating to measure the age of the earth and you know meteorites and lunar samples, things like that. By looking at these decays, we know the rate that they decay at, we know how much is left, we know how much has already decayed, so we can do the math backwards and figure out, well, how much uh, how much time has passed from when the sample was first there. Let's look at this in a kind of timeline fashion. So I tried to make this timeline. It's going to be a little bit uh, hard to read on here. Maybe I can shift this around just a little bit. And I make this work decently. There we go. And let's put this down here. Okay, so let's list off a couple of these important events on this timeline. So we're going from 13.8 billion years ago, this is time in the past, to now. And, and GYR, that's giga years. So that's billions of years, just for the units that I've listed on here. So right here, we have the universe begins. Let me see if I can just dial this in a tiny bit better. Yeah, close enough. So universe begins. As I'm making these recordings, if I'm like writing too small and I should change that for future videos, please let me know and I'll try to uh, um, change how I make the videos accordingly. At around 12 billion years ago, uh, galaxies start to form. Galaxies and first stars, first clusters of stars. Some of the first individual stars would probably have been a little bit earlier than that too, but again, this is kind of ballpark estimates. And then it seems like a whole bunch of nothing happens until four and a half billion years ago, we get our solar system forming. Solar system. After that, we get to kind of closer times. This would be about a quarter million years ago. That would be around here. Uh, we get the dinosaur start. And then 65 million years ago, which would be around here, dinosaurs end. And really on this scale, we wouldn't even really be able to see where humans start showing up on the screen. And then this recording started a little less than an hour ago. Uh, yeah, we wouldn't even be able to put that on that scale. But there's a couple of important things that I wanna emphasize with this. Okay? We have this big gap between when the first clusters of stars were forming, the first galaxies were forming, and then how long it took for our particular solar system to form. So video. Okay. Well, what was going on during all that time? Well, actually, it turns out something incredibly important was happening because in the early universe, the early universe would have just been hydrogen and helium. So just hydrogen and helium in early universe. Am I gonna be able to make rocky planets like the Earth if the only thing in the universe is hydrogen and helium? Probably not. We need other 
elements from the periodic table in order to make a rocky planet like the Earth. So the first clusters of stars, the first stars would have just been hydrogen and helium, and they wouldn't have had any planets because there would have been no rocky material to form those planets out of. But when we start looking at the properties of stars, we're going to see that, well, stars can take hydrogen and helium, and inside of the cores of those stars, those stars are fusing hydrogen and helium into heavier elements. So hydrogen fuses into helium, uh, three heliums will fuse into carbon, carbon and helium will fuse into oxygen, and start making more and more heavy elements. So in the early universe, in these first couple billion years, uh, that hydrogen and helium is starting to clump together under gravity and starts making galaxies and, and the stars that are in those galaxies. And these first galaxies and these first stars are forming more and more heavy elements. We're going to talk about this idea of stellar nucleosynthesis, how heavier elements are formed inside of stars. And then when the star eventually has formed more and more of these heavy elements and eventually runs out of fuel, the stars will basically, at the end of their life, either go supernova or end their life by throwing off a lot of that enriched material back into the universe or back into their host galaxy and that will make new generations of stars that are now, um, now enriched with those heavier elements. So what's going on in this period are earlier stars uh, form heavy elements. They die and disperse elements. Back into the galaxy where they now form new generations of stars. And those exploded star guts that now have these elements, those run into other, mix with other clouds of dust and gas, start being collected together again by gravity and start making new generations of stars that now have the right material around them to also form things like rocky planets, to form things like our solar system. So our solar system, a solar system like ours, could not have formed earlier, uh, uh, all that much earlier in the history of the universe, at least solar systems that have the kind of rocky planets that you know we live on. The This has a really interesting, uh, conclusion that the elements that make up you, everything other than the hydrogen and helium, which again, helium doesn't really make up you, hydrogen, it's a lot in your body, but mostly in the form of water, H2O. Um, all of the oxygen that you breathe, the calcium in your bones, the iron in the hemoglobin of your blood, all of those elements were originally formed in these earlier generations of stars in the nuclear furnaces in those earlier generations of stars dispersed into, back into the galaxy at the end of those stars' lives and now make up you. We are literally made up of exploded star guts. Again, later in the course, we're going to talk about how this process occurs in more detail, talk about the evidence that, you know, this is a cool story, but, you know, where's the evidence? How do we what is the evidence that gives us confidence that this story is actually accurate? We're going to be going into that in a lot more detail uh, later on in the course. So hopefully that gives an interesting overview of cosmic time. One last thing that I just want to quickly mention before ending this session is talking a little bit about Earth's motion through space. So even though it seems like we're at rest, we're moving in several different ways. The Earth is rotating on its axis, and it takes 24 hours to do one rotation. So that is how a day is defined. We're on this rotating Earth, and if the sun is in a certain direction, sometimes we can see the sun, sometimes we can't, and that rotation of the Earth is what defines a day. It takes 24 hours to rotate once on its axis. Uh, the Earth 
also orbits around the sun. Okay, So the Earth is rotating on its own axis, but it's also going around the sun. And it takes one year for the Earth to do a complete orbit of the sun. Next week, we're going to go into a lot more detail about how this how the tilt of the Earth's axis causes the seasons. Um, we'll talk about how this changes our view of the night sky over the course of a night and over the course of a year. Uh, but this is what defines a year. How long does it take the Earth to do one full orbit around the sun? There are other motions that are going on. Our sun is moving kind of randomly in a haphazard way with all of the other stars around us, the speeds are around 70,000 kilometers an hour. So our solar system is, again, moving around with all these other stars around us. But those stars are so far away that it takes very, very specialized equipment to see the very slow across the sky motion of the other stars. We can do it. It just takes very specialized equipment. You can't really see it with the unaided eye. So the sun's moving um, kind of in a haphazard way relative to nearby stars, but all of these stars are in orbit around the center of the Milky Way galaxy with orbital speeds of around 800,000 kilometers per hour. So it takes about 200 million years for the Earth to do one complete rotation around our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, again, I'm not expecting these mem numbers to be memorized. Whenever there's a number that you need to memorize, I will make sure to highlight it like I did for the age of the universe and the age of the Earth. Okay. And on the largest scales, distant galaxies are all seem to be moving away from us, which is indicative that the universe itself is expanding. Again, we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail later on. How do we measure these motions of galaxies away from us? Um, how do we identify that the it's the expansion of the universe that's actually causing this uh, relative motion? Uh, again, this expansion of the universe, it's not that galaxies and stars are themselves getting bigger. It's kind of the spaces between galaxies on very, very large scales. Uh, we see this expansion of the universe. Again, we're going to talk about that in a lot more detail later on, but I will call that one good for this session.